Fire Call, the Fire Safety Show with Division Chief Jim Sedaris. Hi, my name is Division Chief Jim Sedaris, and you are watching Fire Call, where we're going to take you all over Sioux Falls Fire Rescue, top to bottom, stem to stern. You're going to see what it's like to be a firefighter and kind of hang with some of the best folks there are in Sioux Falls. That's Sioux Falls Fire Rescue Firefighters. Now, we always do some questions, and we got a lot of questions this month. We're going to kind of cram those together. Got some shout outs from firefighters from around the country. And if we use your question or your shout out, you get a genuine Sioux Falls Fire Rescue t shirt. Everyone loves the t shirts. Now, sometimes they're going to be yellow printing, sometimes they're going to be white. You know, you get whatever I got, so don't be picky. The first shout out this first shout out goes to James. James is wants a shout out uh, to the Conestoga Volunteer Fire Company in Conestoga, Pennsylvania. I hope I got that right, James. Michael is from Emmas, Pennsylvania, and he would like a shout out to the New Hartford Volunteer Ambulance in New Hartford, Connecticut. And our last shout out goes to Mindy. Mindy lives in Newark, Ohio, and she wants a shout out to the Marianne Volunteer Fire Department. Now this show, you're gonna to wanna to know what's going on in the show, I'll tell you. We got some cool stuff, and I mean cool stuff. This stuff is firelicious cool. We got firefighters from South America. We have Chilean firefighters that are visiting our fire department. We get to interview them. We get to look at, a lot of people wanna know what's the difference between tankers and tenders and water operations. We got that for you. We have a, one of our longtime uh, firefighters, Dan Long's retiring. We're gonna hang out at his retirement, talk to Dan, and finally, we got the coolest thing it's a simulator for aircraft crashes and you know those can happen anytime any place anywhere not just on an airports so we have to be ready to go anywhere anytime for anything so sit back turn off your blackberries tell the kids to sit down and be quiet they just might learn something so stay with us when we say we have firefighters from all over the world watching fire call they not only watch but they visit and we have firefighters here from Chile South America and I have Ray here. Ray is one of the firefighters from the Santiago Fire Department. That's correct. And you're gonna you're authorized to talk to us for a little bit about your fire department. Uh, absolutely, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> now tell us how. Because I was surprised when we talked earlier. How big is Santiago, Chile? Well, Santiago is the capital of of, of Chile. Uh, they live over a little bit more than six million people in the in the core of the city. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, it's in the center of the country, surrounded by the mountains, Andes Mountains on the eastern side, and the Pacific Ocean on the western side. And how many firefighters do you have total for the fire department, uh, roughly? Just the Santiago Fire Department, it has around 2,100 volunteer fire department, fire volunteers. And that's what surprised me. They're all volunteers. How does that work? Because you have to have a pretty good call volume with 6 million people. And you were saying that the fire stations are more like a home for, for the neighborhood. That's correct. Everything started like in around 1863 when uh, this, uh, it was a very big fire in Santiago, the capital of the country, in, in a church by, uh, it was close on the beginning weeks of December, mm -hmm. when, it, when, it, when it was one of the, uh, uh, the virgin, uh, you know, uh, um, activities, and the country's Catholic, so pr pretty much Catholic. Mm -hmm. So it was, uh, many people was inside of the church, the church caught fire, many people died in the church, and because of that result, uh, some people, some movement, some people in the city mm -hmm. start working on, okay, saying we need a fire department, we need somehow to resolve this because many people die. Mm -hmm. So that was the starting of the, the, the first fire department in Santiago. Mm -hmm. The major one is Santiago Fire Department, which has around 2,100 uh, volunteers, and from the from the starting point, it start volunteer, and since 1863 has been 100% volunteer, and it will keep being volunteer, mm -hmm. uh, because it's, it's a matter of of, uh, of the people giving something for the people. Sure. Now you said the age you can start when you're 18, but your average firefighter is almost retired when they're 40. Uh, actually, well, you can start and be volunteer, uh, an active duty volunteer from the 18 years old. Okay. The, at 18, you can ride the trucks, you can go to the coast and do all the, the firefighting uh, operation. Now, you've met a few of our firefighters. Is there a difference between firefighters from Chile and firefighters from the United States, or do you think we're pretty much all the same kind of people? Well, at the end, every, uh, we have something really common, which is mm -hmm. helping the community, no matter what, if you are paid or not paid. Uh, the need to support the community, the need to, to help people, no matter what, it's raining, storming, or mm -hmm. beautiful day, it's a, it drives us the same, the same need or the same ob objective. 
Main difference, I will say that uh, here you have more uh, uh, an uh, offensive action, of offensive towards the fire. More, more aggressive getting in and fighting the fire from the inside. Right, from the inside than from the uh -huh. outside. We use a little more from the outside because, uh, again, we take a lot of things from the NFPA, but also mm -hmm. we take a lot of things from the European way to fight fires. In Europe? In Europe, right. Mm -hmm. And in Europe, it's more defensive from the outside to the inside. Mm -hmm. So we have a kind of a mix on that. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. You're kind of a busy schedule and maybe a little jet lag, but uh, if we can ever do anything for you, just just give us a call and we'll get you on the fire call. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Good Ray. to see you. We have a lot of questions about rural operations and water and water supply, so we're going to ask some questions, and the person to answer them is going to be Tim Schillerstrom. He's a captain of our training center, one of the captains out here, and he's working with this way cool training on drop tanks and but we can't give away the questions okay you ready I'm ready okay first question first question comes from Clinton Clinton lives in Harvardess Grace Maryland and he wants to know how much water is carried on each particular truck well Clinton on our fire apparatus we carry 500 gallons with us on the trucks good that's the short answer that's the, that's, <laughs> that's the answer we want okay this one, next question comes from Jamie. Jamie lives, this is a good question because Jamie lives in Sioux Falls. So it's got to be a good question. Jamie wants to know how many fires can a fire truck fight? That sounds like a, how many fires can a fire truck fight before that runs out of water? And how do you fill your trucks after you fight fires? Good question, Jamie. Well, the amount of fire that we can put out with that 500 gallons of water depends a lot on the conditions we find. So there are some variables. We do have some rules of thumb for our crews, and one of them is the fire flow formula from the National Fire Academy. Which we talked about last show. That will give us a, a general idea of how much water we need to flow to control that fire. Mm -hmm. We also need to think about duration, about how much time we're right. going to be fighting this fire. So we need to be really, that 500 gallons can get us an initial attack on a small fire, a dumpster fire, a car fire. Uh, the short answer is... Yeah, get we to the fight, short answer. We fight one fire with yep. that 500 gallons. And, we're always, and we also hook up to a continuous water supply. We and that's use our the big thing. We want a continuous town. water supply. We want a continuous water supply. Okay, let's, let's move past that one. This one comes from Jared. Jared lives in Lawrenceburg, Tennessee. And he wants to know, how do you get water to your pumper if you don't have any hydrants available? Well, in Sioux Falls, we're spoiled. We have yep. a good municipal water supply. We've got hydrants available at most of our this intersections. This is just a land of milk and honey. Face it. It is. It is. It really, it actually does make it easy for us with water supply here in Sioux Falls. But in our, in our periphery, when we've got that rural urban interface, mm -hmm. we've got some areas of town that do not have the hydrants. That we have to use drop tanks and water tenders. Okay, and wait, wait, wait. Drop tanks and water tenders. Yes. Just wait. Because this question is from Charles. Charles lives in South Lyon, Michigan, and he said on a recent fire in my home, there were portable tanks laid out. How do those portable tanks work and what are they used for? Well, the portable tanks or drop tanks, you can see behind us, and we're actually doing a drill today with some of our crews off the floor and they're practicing their skills of portable water supply. They're using drop tanks, they're using water tenders, and they're creating a, a draft site so that they have a continuous water supply for that draft engine to pump to the attack engine that's actually fighting the fire. Now you talked about, next question, you talked about, you talked about tenders, and there's also tankers. Now people are going to say, hey, that big thing dropping water off is a tanker. Well, this question is from Martin. Martin lives in Emmitsburg, Maryland. Emmitsburg, Maryland is the home of the National Fire Academy, where every firefighter should go in their career at least once, and chief officers should be going on a regular basis. That's my spiel for the National Fire Academy. Great place to go. I've been there many times. I love it. Martin wants to know, please, and briefly, explain the difference between a tanker and a tender, and why do we call them that? Well, Martin must know us, yes. since he asked briefly to explain <laughs> no, the I, difference. I, oh, you I, asked briefly. I to took explain. the liberty. <laughs> I know how it goes with you, Tim. The short answer. The half-hour show. Yes. The short answer is tankers fly, 
tenders drive. Tankers are our air assets. Uh, the fire service airplanes with big airplanes, tanks on them. Airplanes. Um, the fire service and emergency response in general. We've had some major incidents in the last decade, last two decades, that have really caused us to look at how we use command and control. Mm -hmm. We're having to respond with other agencies. We're having to respond with other services across disciplines, not just So we need to standardize language. We needed to standardize our language. We need to standardize our command. It comes out of the incident command system. Tankers have been standardized to mean air assets, aircraft, both fixed wing and rotor wing. So or if I were to wing. call and say, I need a tanker drop on this location, thinking I'm going to get this showing up. You're not going to get no, this. No, I'm, I'm going to get something flying over and dropping yes. stuff on me. Yes, a, a tanker would drop it from the air. Behind us, as it pulled up, you would see one of our water tenders. My tenders see drive. Here. Yes. So, Martin, I hope that explains it. Standardization is a good thing because one of the biggest problems is always going to be communication and logistics for any major situation. Uh, talking about our tenders, this is from Austin. Austin lives in East Prairie, Missouri. And he wants to know if we have baffles on our the tanks within our trucks. Yes, we do. Both what do our, baffles do? What a baffle is, uh, for uh, anyone that's got a background in the Navy, it's basically a bulkhead. Uh, for us people that stay on land, it's a wall. Okay. It's a wall with inside that tank. It does have passages through that wall. And the purpose of that wall is to help resist the motion of driving. So we don't get sloshing So we don't get that forth. water sloshing. Uh, we, those baffles take away some of that energy of that motion. Much like the old waterbed days. Yes. Okay, we'll go quickly past that. And yes. on to this question wants to know, how does this whole tanker drop tank or the tender drop tank operation work? Well, it, it starts with obviously you have to have a source of water. Uh, the tender is going to have some water in it. Our tenders hold 2,000 gallons. They dump that into a drop tank that also holds 2,000 gallons from that drop tank the operator can draft or pull that water out Suck of that drop out. tank and run it to the pump. Well, obviously we have to refill that tender so that we can refill that drop tank. We have a usually a water fill site. Sometimes it can be a hydrant in town. Sometimes uh, when we're working with our neighbors in the periphery, when we're working with our rural departments, they actually set up a water fill station. And we could have multiple tenders doing drop-offs. So multiple it could be just tenders. Like a big circle. Yep. They're, off, they're delivering up. water, they're traveling to the fill site, filling back up, transporting that water to the dump site, and, and dropping the water. And what makes this really critical is that the operator maintains water supply, so he, has to, he or she has to always be watching that water supply to make sure they don't run out of water faster than they can be resupplied by that tender. Yes, the, the water supply officer has to work with that pump operator or that source pumper, and and uh, he has to let them know when water is going to be coming. If there's a problem with a unit or a tender, and maybe a train, who knows? Mm -hmm. There could be a hundred delays. But if a, a unit gets out of that rotation, that could affect our water supply. So that water supply officer, he's got to communicate that with that operator. Mm -hmm. That operator then will have to let attack know because that's going to impact their decisions on sure. the fire ground. Especially if you have people inside a building. Especially if we have people inside a building. Now, if there are some quirks when we start looking at this water supply, how do we get water from one tank, one drop tank to the other drop tank? Some of our viewers may have noticed there's more than one tank behind us. They're sharp. They're <laughs> sharp that way, yes. Uh, we do use multiple drop tanks to increase our water supply, and it also gives us more freedom with where that tender can dump its water. Uh, we try not to drop water right out of a tender into that draft tank because that motion can disrupt or introduce air into our pump. Uh, we move water from tank to tank uh, primarily by a device that we could refer to as a jet siphon. It's a piece of hard suction hose. We supply a special fitting with a water supply 
And what we do is we create a venturi. Mm -hmm. We create a low pressure area and that water moving through that hard suction pipe will pull water from the tank with it to the next tank. So you're basically siphoning from one to We're the other. siphoning from one to the other. And then now when you do the siphoning, we've, we've seen sometimes you get those little vortexes forming in the water. You do, you have to be careful with your vortexes because that'll introduce air into the system. And what's air doing to the system? Air in the system can create all kinds of problems, especially with our pumps. Uh, the biggest thing, the immediate threat is that we'll lose pressure. That's the immediate threat. The okay. next immediate threat is the threat actually to the pump itself. We can actually cavitate the pump if our Meaning supply. What? When you cavitate a pump. When we cavitate a pump, we are supplying water faster to the discharge side than the intake side, and we're outstripping our water supply. So how do we prevent that? What's a simple thing? What simple things do we do to prevent that? We try to increase our supply with an additional jet siphon or an additional drop tank. We may, we may, we don't like to do this, but we may have to gate back or shut down how much we are supplying to the attack bumper. Um, we like to supply a consistent supply. Sure. Uh, a consistent supply to the attack is better than an inconsistent supply that has spikes and and uh, dry spells. When we have the, the vortexes that form, I know they're using a real low tech way. We are using some low technology there. Uh, that uh, just from that siphon action, when we're drafting out of that tank, you'll get a vortex to form in the pool. Uh, that vortex introduces air. We talked about how right. air is bad. We can disrupt that vortex with a very simple device. Uh, a lot of companies will carry an inflatable beach ball. Today, we're using one of our volleyballs or soccer balls that we've uh, and it, acquired. And it works. It works. All you have to do is have something on the surface of the water to disrupt that vortex and stop that spinning. Great. Well, Tim, you took us from questions to answers, <laughs> and we appreciate it. Well, thank you, Jim. <laughs> Thanks a lot. That's a really good question. We get a lot of questions like this, and we're going to take this one from Matt. Matt lives in Jamestown, North Dakota, and he wants to know, do Sioux Falls Fire Rescue do any training with the firefighters at the crash station base at the air airport? And if so, what kind of training do they do? Well, Matt, you are in luck, my friend. Timing is everything. We do specialized training with the crash firefighters because you never know when a plane's going to come down. Now, to step you through this, step by step through this cool training we have, a great simulator, we're going to have Battalion Chief Steve Dirksen, who's in charge of training, take us through step by step so you're going to see, Matt, exactly what we do in that training. We're training with uh, Joe Foss Field Crash Rescue. Uh, they invited us because of their response, we're part of their response to any type of aircraft emergency that would happen at the, at the airfield. So we need to take the opportunities to train together. They brought the simulator in, and this is a great opportunity for Sioux Falls Fire Rescue to train with the guys that know how to fight aircraft emergencies. Well, history has shown us that not all airplane crashes happen exactly on the airport ground, so this gives our people uh, within the city of Sioux Falls uh, the opportunity to train on a simulator that if an aircraft would go down outside the gates of uh, Joe Foss Field, that we have an idea of what we're going to encounter and how we need to proceed from uh, that point. Everything that you see here is controlled from a remote station. There's different cameras set up at, at uh, various points within the prop here. And when there's a controller inside that's watching everything that's going on, there's thermal imaging inside the, inside the aircraft. There's cameras on the outside. So if he sees anything, he can pull the plug on it right now, stop it. And it also gives, he can give feedback to the crews on whether they're hitting the spots that they need to in, in the practice to, you know, make sure that the fire's out so they're getting some real life experience with this. Uh, what you're seeing here is the crews from Joe Foss Field, the South Dakota Air, Air National Guard, using their trucks, how they would first attack a fire on an aircraft uh, if, if one would crash at, at the airfield. As they're approaching the airplane, uh, a lot of times fuel will leave the, the tank on the, on the aircraft and will ignite. So the first thing that they're doing here is controlling that fuel fire. And what you're seeing here is they're using water to simulate that, but most of the time they're going to be putting down foam, and that will suppress the vapors and keep the fuel from igniting. 
Uh, with the simulator, what they have is some burn pans that are out there, and the pans are filled with water, and there's uh, different tubes underneath the water, and they're hooked up to a propane tank, and they're uh, bro blowing propane through the tubes and igniting the propane as it bubbles through the water. So they can simulate that. They have a dead man switch on the other end that automatically, if there was a problem, they let go of that switch, the fire goes out, it stops the flow of propane so that if they're, you know, that we're not damaging any trucks or injuring any personnel. Um, what you're seeing now is our crews are integrating with the uh, crash fire guys. Uh, the crash fire guys are obviously in the silver suits. Ours are in the traditional uh, structural bunker gear. The silver suits uh, provide a little more protection from the radiant heat, allows them to uh, go through some a little bit higher temperatures because it reflects a little more heat than what the structural gear does. Uh, our, they're leading our guys through, uh, suppressing the vapors off to the side, again, suppressing uh, the fuel and putting those fires out and making sure that they have an, a way of egress because they're going to have to stop the fire. And what they're doing, again, with the water is simulating a foam blanket that's covering all the fuel. And as those guys go through that, if it was actual foam, they're going to be disrupting that foam blanket and the possibility of flare-ups behind them. So you have one crew that's going through to try and make their way to the aircraft, and you have the other crew that's back there to protect that, that means of egress back out of, to a safe area of refuge. Uh, the next thing that the crews are doing is they're making entry into the aircraft, uh, taking a line in there, suppressing whatever fire that they, they may encounter, and finding victims and taking the victims out and removing them to a safe area. This opportunity was, uh, we couldn't pass this up when we were invited by the South Dakota Air National Guard uh, to be part of this training that they're bringing in here. We had to, had to take full advantage of it. We work with these guys on a regular basis. We train with different hazmat events. And any time that we can work with crews that we do mutual aid with, that is just, that's very important. And our crews get to see each other in a training atmosphere versus in a real life situation. So we have, you know, an opportunity to at least we're meeting each other before we have to meet each other at an incident. We have two great questions, and these questions all about being a firefighter, and there's no one better to answer these than Dan Long, whose today is your retirement day. 28 years. 28 years, and I tell you what, Dan, it has been fun. You've been around to some of the biggest fires we've had, and I just uh, we interviewed you a couple weeks ago or a couple shows ago on a two-alarm apartment fire. Right where you rescued seven people out of windows. Yes, off so, the balconies. Yep. So I got you ready for these two questions? Sure. This first one is from Paige. Paige lives in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, so it's going to be a good question. Uh, Paige wants to know, how old can you be before you can retire? And you're a young guy. You're well, retiring, last day of work. I feel young, but I'm 52 years old, and I've got 28 <laughs> years of service. So between the 52 years and the 28, that adds up to 80. Mm -hmm. And we have, we have something called the rule of 80, and that means you can retire when your age plus your years in service adds up to 80. Now, some people say, well, still, 52, that's, that's young really guy. young. But we work a different work schedule than most, and, and we work 53 hours a week. Uh, it's 56 hours until they give us the K-Day. Mm -hmm. So that's like getting an extra two days a week. Um, to, to put in the bank, so to speak. So if you look at it, we put in the same amount of hours as someone that worked until they were 65. So long term, we're still working, those, we're getting that time in. Right. We, we over, over that 28 years in, I, I put in the same amount of hours as someone that worked 40 hours and worked until they were 65. Perfect. Okay, this, next, this is another deep question. This is from Austin. Austin lives in East Prairie, Missouri. And Austin wants to know, you know, you go on a lot of tough calls and emergency situations, and you deal with emotionally and physically tough job. How did, what did you learn about yourself as a result? And you've been on more calls than probably most people in a lifetime. What, what, have you, what are some of the things you've learned, Frosted? Well, well, some of the things that you learn is, one, you learn that nothing is ever too tough. And, and whatever hap, happens to you, there's always someone that has it worse. I mean, you... A lot of times people look at themselves and feel sorry for themselves because of this happened or I got sick or this happened or, or whatever. But if you really look around and you see how, how some people really get hurt really badly or, or they're just, their house burns down or whatever and you realize, I've really got it good. Mm -hmm. and, and you start being grateful 
for what you have and 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 that and and so it makes you stronger it makes you you feel like you can accomplish anything that you really want and and when you go through some of these tough times by doing them you become each time you do it you become stronger and it becomes a little easier and a little easier i i never really felt like i felt calloused about mm-hmm. it some people felt feel like they're calloused i never felt that way i kind of felt like like it became easier to accept because you just knew that was the rules of life and and maybe somehow i can just make it smoother sailing for for the people that we deal with now one I, we have one person we always have people asking i know one person has asked us repeatedly what what would you tell someone getting into the fire service you're getting out now you've seen it all done it all what one piece of advice would you give someone that's either thinking about a career in the fire service or is one of those new rookies just getting on the job well if you're the brand new guy first of all be quiet or gal or gal be quiet sit back and listen okay there are guys that have been doing this for an awful long time and they're the ones that that you should learn from and sometimes the best way to learn is just by observing the people you instantly when you walk in the room you know which person it might not be the highest ranking officer but you know which person regardless of rank is the one that everyone kind of looks up to and if you look at that person they look up to him for a reason mm-hmm. it's their demeanor how they do things and what they do and if you can kind of take something from him and get it for yourself that is i think really important there are a number of people that i grew up with i i feel you know that through your career were my through my career that were senior officers and some of them just firefighters mm-hmm. and how they did things and and how they treated people meant a lot to me and how they treated other firefighters mm-hmm. meant a lot to me and and that's who I try and I tried over the years to to be like some of those people. And you did a good job. Thank we you. are we Dan we are really going to miss you. you I'm going to miss you, all you were, of you too. You wear size 15 boots are going to be tough to fill regardless of the size. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Thanks a lot for being with all us right, Dan. Take you. care. Well, I hope you like the show. You know, we got a lot of questions on aircraft rescue, so no more aircraft rescue questions for at least a year, okay? Give some time to catch up. And, you know, we really like to thank uh, Dan Long for spending a, almost his entire adult life with us. You know, we have people that come here, they give their heart and soul to fire service, and they really make a difference when you look at that long of a career. Now, we're going to wrap this up. We've got a couple shout-outs. And remember, shout-outs, questions... You get a t-shirt, and we need good ones. We get lots and lots of questions. Most of them are pretty good. I don't even mind the bad spelling. But you know, if you got a town or a name that's tough to say, help me out a little bit, okay? Because I'm just butchering some of these names. Now, this first uh, shout out is from Brooke. Brooke lives in Lancaster, Wisconsin, and wants a shout out to the Lancaster Fire Department. Uh, probably in Lancaster, Wisconsin. James, James is from Baltimore, Maryland, and he wants a shout out to the North Point Edgemere Volunteer Fire Station 26. And finally, our last shout is from Thomas. Thomas is from Lugoff, South Carolina, and he wants a shout out to the Camden Fire Department in Camden, South Carolina. I hope you like the show. You know, if you got questions, you want to know something about being a firefighter, maybe some of you have been saying, gee, I want to know that. I'm going to ask Jim. Just fire off an email question. You know, it's surprising the amount of questions we get. We try to get to those questions, but it might take a while. We're doing our best. It's all I can do, you know? Give me a break. Rich is here filming this stuff, and it's tough for us sometimes. So I hope you like the show. Hang with us. Next month, we'll have another one. My name is Division Chief Jim Sedaris, and you've been watching Fire Call. <laughs>